Where shall I begin? I guess it's towards the end of the day, so hopefully you guys still have energy. It's great to see you guys. I just want to say thank you to Data Artisans and for everyone that's kind of put on this event. So it's a privilege to be here, and I definitely uh, feel lucky. So um, I'm here to talk about approximate filter, join, and group by. Having spoken to some people who are doing similar work, you may want to like kind of think of this more as similarity filtering, joins, and group buys. Um, the idea is essentially at some point things are going to be approximated. So um, maybe just nuances to everything. So um, yeah, so I guess like I'd love, this is a pretty small group. I would love your guys' like feedback at any given point. I might kind of ask some like rhetorical questions here and there. Um, and it would be great if you say something back. Um, so maybe just to start, uh, Anyone, or like maybe just raise a hand, how many people are using things like locality sensitive hashing in some form or other, maybe potentially like day to day? Okay, that's cool. Um, I, call, I think that that's a good sign for me. <laughs> and I can maybe show you guys something that I've been working on with some teammates uh, uh, and friends at Cisco. So, a little bit about us. Um, Maybe starting with myself, uh, I'm David. I'm a security researcher and data scientist at Cisco. Um, I work on a really, I feel lucky to work on a team that's uh, R&D, but at the same time, we push things out to production. So um, I kind of get the, the best of both worlds. Uh, I have a friend on the team. His name is Scott Sitar. He's an amazing uh, guru at distributed systems, maybe, is a good word for this. Um, and he has a huge passion in math. And then also Dia Majub, who is the leader of this team. And a uh, uh, graph theorist, I think, is what he likes to be considered. <laughs> so maybe I can start and like kind of and get you guys kind of like closer to my world and the things that I think about on a day to day basis. I work at Cisco, uh, I work on a team called Umbrella, where what they do is they service essentially DNS requests on the internet. So my job is to think about as many different ways people act maliciously on the internet and try to stop that. So maybe the best way I can kind of describe that is by, at a high level, showing you one threat in particular that we've been exploring for the last year. Here's an example. Looks like some of the things are actually blotted out, but the, the meaningful things are still here. So here's about 20 different websites or domains. Along here is each of them kind of differentiated and then plotted for 30 days with about like the, the number of queries of people, or at least our user base, that actually go to those websites. <clears throat> what you'll notice is that there's a fair amount of fluctuation between at least some of these, right? So there's this one that's fairly periodic. It looks actually smaller than, let's say, these spiking ones. And what's important, or like what's interesting here, is that these spiking ones are actually known as spam, and they're actually sometimes malicious, meaning that they try to actually have people download things from their emails, which then they bring down payloads that actually infect their computer. And so this, this stuff in particular is really interesting to me because I look at it from a pattern recognition point of view. So here, I'm staring at this, right, when a, f a friend of mine, um, his name is Jakob, he actually showed me this. He's like, man, I'm seeing this stuff constantly. Can we stop this? And when you look at this, you, you think to yourself, we've got to be able to stop this, right? I mean, it's just the pattern is so obvious. But at the same time, things are very fast, and we have a lot of data and a lot of different domains at any given time, so it's hard to sometimes just sift in and find these. So that's what I would like to try to just talk about, is scalable ways of doing this. So maybe to kind of like bring you also into the world that I'm trying to immerse myself in, in terms of the literature and stuff, is to think about um, someone who's been really influential in this field, is Michael Mitzemacher. <clears throat> and he wrote a book called Probability and Computing, which is a really interesting way of thinking about all the different algorithms that you can use that approximate really hard computations. And he gave a talk at Cisco, I think, in just like the last year or so, and the, the title of this talk was called Some Uses of Hashing, in networking problems. And the idea was, how many different ways can you solve a lot of different problems if you can use some form of hashing? And his takeaway at some point in this talk was essentially this. He says, the key and simple idea is that you just partition your data into buckets, 
by hashing, and then you analyze it. So essentially, the idea is somehow get things kind of closer together that are kind of related, and then use this smaller subset to do more expensive computations or whatever it is that you want to do. So to me, this is kind of interesting.、Uh, you know, it's just for context. So an overview. What I'm going to do is hopefully just kind of take you through、uh, a few building blocks that will lead us to maybe an application. So I'm going to talk about using just traditional primitive types to filter, join, and group by. And I'll try to do that not in like a very、uh, very introductory way, but at the same time I want to just show you simple examples that you might be familiar with, and we can play like a couple games, okay? And so then from that I'll try to like introduce why we actually want to maybe sometimes use. Non-primitive filters, joins, or group bys, or you want to find items that are somewhat similar, and then do those same things or with those same、uh, design patterns that you have for very specific primitive types. And so that'll introduce. So then, to do that though, I'll need some machinery. I'll use locality-sensitive hashing, and in particular, I'm going to kind of focus on the cosine measure of it, which, or the cosine measure technique, which essentially is going to allow us to go back to that original problem that I showed. But there's other forms of it that deal more with different types of data. For example, there's、um, min hashing, which will allow you to group things that are more similar when they're text. And so then, in the end, I'll kind of show an application. I'll try not to repeat myself, so it's going to be a slightly different application of also detecting botnets on the internet.、Um, but they'll be somewhat related to that initial、uh, or the original、uh, picture that I showed you. So primitives. Okay, so for example, consider this. Consider you have like just clickstream data, okay? And here you have just essentially like some like URL, and then you have like a stream of this stuff. <clears throat> and so you're probably pretty familiar with this design pattern in Flink. And so what I'm going to do is somehow rely on this thing called URL extractor down here. And then apparently the output of it, I'll just key over or group by、uh, the first part or the first item in the tuple. And then apparently I'll just sum over the second index. So the idea is I just want to count or find the most frequent things that are in URLs, right? And so if I define that URL extractor as this, I'm just kind of curious. Can you guys see this?、Um, can you tell me what actually that output of that program would actually give? So again, I'll go back really quick. So that's your input data, and then I show you this regex. I'm going to split over this. What's going to be the result? Yeah, in a way, like I'm splitting, but what am I splitting? I'm just saying, like, get me the stuff that looks like words. Okay, going back to that original part. Okay, I'm just saying, like, hey, go get me HTTP, go get me www, etc. You might be familiar with this type of stuff, right? Where like you have some Flink programs that are actually doing this type of stuff. And so, I guess my my question is, like, is that what you really want? Have you ever looked at stuff like this, where you're kind of like, that's cool, I can do that, but essentially that's meaningless. Like it's sort of like, wait, what did I just do here? It's like、um, I just counted HTTP. That's obviously going to be the top, or www. Like it's a bunch of stuff that's just going to get propagated up. You're like, oh, that's really cool. I'll do anomaly detection on that. Er, wait a minute. That stuff is obviously fine. So, so now it's kind of like just slowing down and just kind of asking a question. What did you really want to do? If I give you clickstream data and you have URLs like this, you might want to ask yourself slightly different questions than just count the words that are there. And for example, you might want to just know what Google searches were in those that clickstream that were pretty similar. Like maybe a lot of people are going to like a lot of similar stuff, but they might be like changing one of the words. For example, they go to Flink forward, and then someone types Berlin, and then someone types in San Francisco. But in a way, you'd actually like to know how many people were going to Flink forward, right? But there's only one word that's off, and so you're kind of like,、uh, those are kind of similar Google searches. So I kind of want to count those together. So in a way, but like, there's so many different possibilities, you can't really like enumerate these. What is the regex? What's that thing that you're going to give that's going to like be able to take any URL and then find all the things that you just want to count? Like, oh, how many times did this occur? So in a way, you kind of need a more unsupervised method. 
OK, so that's one example. Here's another example. I'm going to ask a question again. <laughs> um, here's your program. You're given an, a, a stream, or in this sense, it's just a data set in Flink. Uh, you're given this uh, stream of elements that are just integers. And I say, hey, can you just count the frequencies, but kind of like do it in a histogram? OK, so I, defined that I need to define this uh, flat map function called histogram. OK, so def suppose I define it like this. Then now can I ask again, what's the output of that previous program? It's totally OK if you're shy. Um, I don't know if I was sitting out there, if I'd be answering. Um, but do you kind of see it? Do you see what I'm kind of doing? I'm saying, hey, take these really big numbers and just chop them down by the log, and then floor it, like just make it another integer, and then just kind of just count these things together, right? So in a way, I'm kind of like twisting around the numbers and saying, hey, if you're like 1 million and 1, and then 1 million and 2, you guys are basically the same. So just count those things as if they were the same in the stream. But maybe that's not exactly what you want either. Maybe in your stream, actually, sometimes you're actually going to be given not just one value, but two. And I'm going to ask you, hey, when you, I give you two numbers, I need you to group together thing, two things, or like, I need you to group together two elements in the stream that look similar. So now you've kind of got this combination of four things that you need to kind of put together in some interesting way. So for example, uh, in this example, I give you like a tuple of 10, 0, and then 10, 1. I don't know what your use case would be, but those might be considered similar for your use case, OK? Maybe 5, 5, 4, 5. Those are actually close enough to being like each other that you actually want to count those together. Now, like, rather than relying on my histogram technique, right, where I kind of chose the logarithm, I chose to floor it, Essentially, I chose to discretize it in a very specific way. You may need something a little more robust. So maybe I'm trying to build the case that maybe, just maybe out there, there's a, a reason for you to start approximating. OK, so let's like go to the point. Uh, here's another program. And there's four uh, elements in this stream. And there's associated with it a name and then a signal. And there's a few of them in here. There's Flinker 1, Flinker 2, Flinker 3, Flinker, no, Unflinker 1. OK. So again, just like in that previous example, maybe there's some elements in this stream that you actually do think are close enough to each other that you actually would, if you were to group or to join or to filter over, you'd actually want them to be close to each other. So what I'm saying, maybe if you were to kind of actually look at this from the word signal, you could actually look at this as if I'm kind of trying to say, can you find waveforms that are like each other? And they, but they might be dilated or contracted in, in like some sort of horizontal axis. That's maybe one case. So going back to my original example, right? I'm kind of, kind of bringing you into my world, which is like I've, I get these, these, these ticks of data, essentially like stock prices, but there are domains on the internet, and there are how many people are going there. And at any given moment, I know something's malicious, and I just want to say, go give me anything else that literally looks like that right now. And so, in a way, like maybe there's one of those signals, or there's a few, and I'm trying to kind of like weed through which ones are pretty similar to each other. OK, so now, like really kind of drilling into this, though, what do you mean by similar? I guess like, that's the question I'm going to keep asking myself over and over and over again, is that I need to define that pretty mathematically at some point. But intuitively, you can ask yourself just all the different combinations. And you can essentially unwind exactly what kind of measurement that you want when you're actually asking the question about similarity that you're actually going to use. So for example, when I give you the, this first example of 100, 0, and 100, would you consider 100, 0, and 101 similar to each other? OK, you know, you don't have to be super precise, but it's just a question for yourself. Here's another one. If I give you the 100, 0, and 100, would you consider 50, 0, and 50 similar to each other? 
And now let me like say it again. 100, 0, and 100 is that similar to 100, 0, and 50. Now think about this. It's, it's three coordinates, essentially, in three-dimensional space. And I'll try to start to visualize what these actual vectors look like. There's some of these vectors in three-dimensional space that actually really are really close to each other in an interest, like, geometric way. So maybe I can I kind of introduce you guys to locality-sensitive hashing. Uh, definitely, I, if you guys have heard of it, um, I'm going to try to bring you up through not just theory that I think is just theory, but also like ways to think about this that are going to help you actually deploy stuff if you actually start to play with it. So imagine I give you two vectors. So for example, it's this orthogon or there are two vectors that are orthogonal, and one is along the x-axis and one is along the y. And when I give you two vectors, there's always one thing that, especially if you're in some sort of Euclidean space, I can always just ask you something about how they're related through the actual degrees of rotation that it takes for one to get to the other. Now, if you're familiar with calculus, another way of thinking about this is if you take the dot product of any two vectors, we know that that's equal to the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other times the cosine of the angle between them. OK, that's a mouthful. Unwind that. But what I'm trying to say is, actually, when I give you some angle, you can totally compute it as long as you give me the two vectors. So that's kind of cool. More formally, then, what I'm saying is that, that angle between the vectors, because of that type of logical operations that you can use on them, actually formally describes something known as a distance measure, i.e., they, they, it follows this type of property. Whenever I give you an angle, there's something about it that when I give you the same vector with itself and I ask you about the angle between it, I know that it's always going to be zero. Or something about if I give you any two vectors, and I kind of flop them or like switch them around, whatever that means in your space, and essentially it's the same measure between them or distance. And then again, uh, it obeys this sort of property that essentially it's not negative. OK. Now, how is this leading anywhere close to hashing and this types of approximation? So maybe I can get you and, and us there together now. So imagine now you're, you're in a two-dimensional space, and you have, your two, uh, you have your two vectors. And at any given point, you actually just drop another vector, but maybe just call it a hyperplane. So it goes in infinite direction in one, infinite direction in the other. And then take the normal of it. OK, so it's orthogonal to that, that thing that I just dropped randomly. And now take the dot product of the normal vector with any one of those two vectors that I gave you. OK, this sounds really confusing, but what I'm trying to ask now, or let me like, make it more formal, is what's the probability that that normal vector is essentially inside the angle between the two, ve the two given vectors that I gave you? OK, so that's kind of an interesting problem. If you can kind of start to like, digest that, then actually there's a lot of symmetry in this space. But there's something about 180 degrees that feels really interesting here, right? Because it's a hyperplane that's down. It's going in infinite directions. In some ways, I only need to kind of tell you something about the 180 to fully define things. Well, said differently, if I were to kind of play a game when I take this, this uh, normal vector, dot it with any one of, or one of the two. And if I were to take then the sign of the dot product, then I can actually ask whether or not you're going to be on one side of that hyperplane or the other. So I can kind of define a function that's really simple that just essentially tells me like that, literally. It's like, hey, kind of like by kind of default, just make it 0, make it 1, if it's a positive or if it's like on the negative side of the hyperplane based on the dot product. Then I can ask, if I start dropping a bunch of these hyperplanes down, I can ask, what's the probability that any two hyperplanes are going to essentially give me the same thing back? Now, this is kind of cool, because what's happening is if I keep dropping this stuff over and over randomly, I, have like no ch like I, don't, I don't have any reason to like try to push it in one direction or the other. 
then I'm going to start telling you something about the probability that the, these angles, because based on how big or small it is, that actually I'm going to overlap with it. OK, so going back to our original question, is 100, 0, and 100 similar to 100, 0, and 101? Let's like, stop thinking about the math so much. Think about now the angle between them. In some direction, maybe it's like, let's call this last uh, component of this tuple, like z, then I've only moved up one in the direction of z. But I, I, I kept the x and the y the same. So in a way, I've changed the angle just a little bit, not a ton. When I compare it at least to, let's say, the next example of 100, 0, and 100, and 50, 0, and 50, um, I've, I've totally changed where the vectors are um, and they're pointing. But do you kind of see what's potentially happening here uh, with, this, with these two vectors? OK, I won't like, answer that, but now kind of think one more time about this one and think about the angles that are happening between them. OK, so what this is doing, it's formally describing something that we, we can actually kind of write down on paper, and that's something about something called p-stable functions or hash families. So what I'm saying is that if I give you a certain uh, distance, let's say, if, if two vectors are within 20 degrees of each other, then there, I want a really high probability that uh, they, this actually happens, or that any two hash functions do the same thing. Then if I kind of flip it around and I say, actually, if I have an angle of 120 degrees between any two vectors, then I want it to be really low probability that they're essentially the same then we can kind of start to figure out how many hyperplanes you drop in this space to actually tell you when two vectors are essentially like each other. So one way of doing that is to use some sort of what they call and-or combination, um, or or-and. So I don't know why uh, the numbers aren't appearing here. Uh, there's numbers here. Uh, I'm super sorry about that. Um, but maybe I can just kind of walk you through this really quick. Actually, the meaningful part is actually in the top right, which is, looks really silly. It's something like 1 minus p to the 2, and then all this stuff minus that, or 1 minus all of that stuff, and then raise that again to the second power. What these numbers we're going to do is going to tell you something about how likely the probability that any two of these vectors are similar to each other, uh, if they were 20 degrees to each other, or apart from each other, or 40, or 60, or 80, or 100. And apparently, here, here's the number for 100. But what I'm saying is that if you drop four hyperplanes, then this is how much like, degrees of freedom, essentially, I'm giving you to win before you say something's like each other. OK, so that's enough of that. Uh, it looks like you guys are falling asleep, so hopefully not. Um, OK, let's go back to this example. And I just want to show you how this actually works out in practice. So here was the original program I showed you. If I gave you four signals and I was going to ask the question, which ones of them are similar to each other? Here's just some like, kind of predefining stuff so that it's a little bit cleaner down here. But basically, I'm going to come in here, just like we've been doing before, and now just ask, what does it mean to essentially take a hyperplane signature of the signal based on, like, let's say, four uh, hash functions? OK, so in that function, or in that method, I'm going to kind of formally going to just go through a very simple example, where if I give you the, the dimension of the space that I'm starting with, which is 3, and I start dropping hyperplanes, there's a nice theoretical result that says, actually, those hyperplanes don't have to actually wiggle around a lot. Actually, they can just be on the orthogonal axes, which is a kind of cool result. Um, but using that and not having to prove it or anything, uh, let's say I just, I just construct and I define them myself right there at the top. One, two, three, four, five, six hyperplanes, but I think one's repeated, so it's really five. Um, but basically, all I'm going to do is take the dot product of any two vectors or any given vector. I'm going to start dotting them with all these hyperplanes, the normals of the hyperplanes. 
and then I essentially take the sign of it, and essentially that's my signature. Okay? If I did it for four hyperplanes, then I'm going to get some combination of A, B, A, A, or A, A, B, B, all this stuff that essentially defines what cluster this vector should be in. Okay, so that was a Java implementation that's very brute force and it's very simple. It's like lots of um, loops and things like that. Another way of doing this is maybe here. Uh, this is done just using the Breeze uh, library in Scala, where it's essentially playing around with the real mathematics behind it, which is essentially just like a matrix vector product. Okay. So let's go back to the original uh, question here, or, or like, let me pose it as a question. Now, if we play this game of all these elements in the stream, which ones do you think are actually going to get clustered similarly? Yeah, and like, can you just maybe say explicitly why you think that? Um, yeah. So hopefully, fingers crossed, right? So there's a little bit of like wiggle room here, but yeah, the intuition is simple. It's just the angle between them. In a way, it's a little like a bit of a stretch when like you first see this example of like the 50, 0, 50 coming into this group, but it, hopefully it kind of makes a little bit of sense now. So after I ran this program, uh, essentially that's what happened, right? So here you see like the signature and then the group and then how many things were in that group. And so the top one was A, A, B, B, A, B, and then it was by itself, and then the other ones actually got grouped together. That's pretty cool. Okay, so I, you might have, I might have lost you for a little bit there, but that's a pretty cool idea that like, I didn't go in there and like, say, hey, there's some threshold where like, these vectors should look like each other or anything like that. I just kind of, like, kind of picked the number of things that I'm going to create, these random hyperplanes, or these orthogonal, or these normals to the hyperplanes, and I just kind of just did this matrix product thing, and then I was done, right? So it's kind of cool. All right, so now, what, how do, can you like, kind of start to like, rethink things that maybe you've seen before? Okay, so let's say you're given some pipelines where maybe you have some source, and then you're going to filter based on another criteria. Well, that's kind of an, a kind of typical design. Another one is where you're actually going to join. Uh, and then maybe given some criteria, like maybe one uh, of the streams actually has priority or the other, or maybe you do a group by. But what I'd actually like to do is actually kind of flip this around, where that's totally true. What we just did was an example where, like, given a, like, any random data, you can just kind of start putting, things will start to kind of get grouped together that are similar to each other. But I want to bring you back to my world, which is like, actually, we know usually some things that are bad. And so you can kind of adversarially pollute your stream based on the known things that are kind of bad, or you have some kind of thing where you're like, go get me everything else that looks like this, approximately. And so I kind of think of it in this way, like suppose you have some sort of source that's maybe you call it mal for malicious, and then another source, unk for unknown, and then you just kind of hash them, then filter. You hash them, then join. You hash them, then group by. So why does this make sense? So like the evolution of, let's say, uh, the number of people visiting a website over time is essentially going to change, right? But I know certain websites on the internet are just bad, they're compromised. But I don't really know the behavioral attributes of the number of people being uh, maybe, let's say, rerouted there or not. And so in a way, I ask the question, I don't know, but I know that thing's bad as of right now, it's compromised, but I don't know what it basically looks like in terms of user patterns. So just throw it into the stream of everyone else right now and just go get me everything that looks like it. Like, I don't even care. And so that's a way of like not having, you, you kind of bring the problem back to you, right? You start from like something, some source that you kind of know. So another way of thinking about it is now I can kind of just set it up like this, where essentially I have some stream that's maybe a bad, bad flinker stream. I say, whenever you see this signature, that's bad. No way. Like, but I don't know what the hash is going to look like yet, but I know that when I see that signal, that's bad. Now just like take in your other stream and just kind of play this game where you just start like kind of joining and then filtering things that should look or like, that are essentially approximately like those bad things that you knew about. So an application. Uh, 
One way that I've been playing around with this uh, is essentially on our Hadoop cluster, taking our DNS logs, which is essentially just traffic of all of our user base, and the, the websites that they query at any given second. And I kind of do this in two different steps, uh, in Uzi workflows that kind of like break this stuff down with a combination of MapReduce, Jobs, and Flink, uh, that essentially do some sort of aggregations, and then some projections. Usually these projections are essentially like graphical properties. I want like connected components and things like this, about like some sort of uh, user items uh, pairing. And what this does is it allows that within a batch, fairly quickly to take about 5, 000, or 5 million domains per batch, which then I then hit HBase uh, with a kind of like clever row key design to go get, let's say, signals that are typically in the range of about 700 components or, or, or readings. And then I play this game, I just hash it. And I say, go get me anything that looks like that compromised domain, or let's say that original spiking spam domain. So in practice, another way of seeing this is here's about 200 domains that are known to be bad, and they seem to come and like, kind of group together like families. So for example, there's Pushto, Neckers, Game, uh, Game Over, Zeus, and Pixpa here represented. And, and in a way, like here's what those websites look like. These are botnets, which essentially means that when a computer is infected, um, is essentially playing a like, round-robin game of randomly trying to query a website that actually has been uh, registered or something like that within the command and control so that it actually can probably go get routed to another domain, which then kind of like brings back the payload. Which then, what, it compromises maybe this person's personal identifiable information or, um, or maybe just brings that computer into the botnet. So essentially it's under their control to do other computations. And the last part of this that I haven't kind of talked about is a further kind of like process on top of this, which is given those signals, we kind of want to compress things as much as we can, right? So an, you know, another step, like kind of thinking about approximation and the worlds of sketching and sketching algorithms is to kind of think about how given a raw signal, you can kind of play some really simple games that will actually kind of help you kind of ensure that various types of collisions are going to happen. So for example, you can histogram it take rolling averages, you can take rolling average histograms. And these are kind of cool because there's lots of fast implementations of these, or fast ways to approximate them. Um, and then from those, you then hash those approximations. So here uh, is just an example of given like a family of eight botnets, which is on the left-hand corner, with each of these techniques, there's kind of like uh, these colors represent the clusterings of things based on those hashes that we've been constructing, and then from each one of these pre-processed uh, signals, we can kind of, kind of pick which one of these kind of best describes the data that we have. In particular, uh, there's something kind of like about these two kind of pairings uh, that caught our eye, um, meaning that they kind of more closely resemble things that might have been happening in the original data that we had labeled. Um, but now we can kind of just take forward these techniques and then just essentially apply it. And usually the fault tolerance is fairly high for us. We don't usually uh, block things because, uh, or we try to have a very low false positive rate because that means we block the internet for people. So um, for some reason, this has been a fairly uh, good technique that we've actually been able to leverage. So, so as a, a recap really quickly, um, I talked about primitives, uh, I talked about non-primitives, locality sensor, the hashing, and then this little application of how we use signals to essentially uh, uh, cluster various uh, bad websites on the internet. So thank you guys. Sorry for going a little fast towards the end. Okay, so um, thank you for the talk. This was yeah. very interesting. Um, but you, you have a step there where you, um, you need to s map the features onto signals, right? So there's a sort of interpretation that you have to do first. And <clears throat> there was one part of my question. The other part is what in the end you find like some false positives? I mean, mm. how do you debug that? Yeah, uh, okay, so the first part, um, 
there is some sort of aggregation, definitely. Like, uh, that, that's like the trickiest part of this all because on, on the other, like we at least on our team we have to manage two things. One is like we have a very uh, uh, a product that is very like user focused, and so actually like these databases, like these HBase databases that are storing a lot of this stuff, are actually running into production too sometimes. So uh, we kind of are trying to kill two birds with one stone, if that phrase makes sense, uh, where. When we do a lot of these like kind of aggregations, we do try to persist them in some sort of like scalable distributed uh, storage system like HBase, um, and then we try to like uh, that's why we're kind of like pulling in Flink from around the corner, and that's why it's a slightly different design pattern than like the original like examples. So I mean it's a good uh, observation for sure. Um, and sorry, your second question. Uh, so, so I mean, what is when something goes wrong, right? So uh, you're right, assuming right, you have the space. Yeah. You're assuming you can map vectors which are yeah, close yeah. together. But then you know you find f some false positives. Yeah. What do you do? Uh, very quickly, we get calls from people that their internet is out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we typically go back and unblock it. Um, uh, with this algorithm, um, there's a lot of things I do in the background. Uh, I, been thinking about these problems for a long time. That I, there's a lot of patterns of users on online that I can kind of typically understand if that's normal behavior or not. So our false positive rate actually is pretty low with this, and so it's actually been performing fairly well. So yeah, and that it's like a kind of mixed blessings on that. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I understood this hyperplane hashing function correctly, but mm -hmm. at least the impression I got is that what you're doing is you're, you're taking this vector space and you're sectioning it off into smaller parts, mm -hmm. and then you're trying to place each vector into which uh, subspace it fell into, and then if they fall into the same space, then they are basically have the same hash. Yeah, yeah, group, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but then you also mentioned that the advantage of this is that you don't have to define how close do things need to be for yeah. them to be on the same hash. But then isn't the amount and orientation of planes that you use essentially defining how big these subspaces are and then yeah. so how close do, th do things need to be for them to form the same group? Yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, so that's a good point, like, for sure. Um, in How do I want to describe it? You're, so you're familiar with k-means algorithm and stuff like that, mm, by chance? Very. OK, but high level. So, so I compared this technique to another technique, let's say k-means algorithm, which essentially defines a centroid. Then you try to like spin out this little ball around that centroid. Yep. You say everything now in that ball like, is essentially the same thing, right? This algorithm feels very different, right? So you're right in that like, there's definitely thresholds that we're trying to pick. Uh, but you, it's very simple, I guess, said differently. I know it's limitations, right? It's going to be really good at things that are really like each other, and that when things are like kind of r definitely not like each other. So right, it, it, it's really good at the extremes. And so I always try to rephrase the problem into the extremes, right? So uh, I set a really low like threshold for like when things are not like each other. And I say like, okay, like even if it's maybe like one bad website, like just don't even do it. It's way too risky. So we're just like really strict. On the other hand, you can be really clever with your pre-processing techniques, right? So histogramming, though it sounds so simple, uh, is a pretty clever way of just kind of getting around doing a Fourier transform or something over the data. So, um, so there's other ways that you can kind of play with knobs that it's not, I don't think of it as necessarily hyper parameter tuning, though it might be kind of somewhat related. Oh, you're essentially yeah. start with some heuristics and then you have to so, sort of uh, try different amount of hyperplanes and different orientations. Yeah, so actually I, I kind of glossed over it really quickly, but this, uh, the p-stable hash families that uh, it gets in the slide, like actually that's literally how you pick the number of hyperplanes. So right. there's actually, a, like the nice thing is that there is a formula that at least tells you kind of within some vicinity when like you're gonna let things essentially get grouped together. Right. So um, in a way that, that's kind of the nice thing. Mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. Yeah. Um, if you have two points, and they're quite close together, but, and you would want to, to have them to have the same hash, mm -hmm. but you're unlucky and you have a hyperplane right in between them. Yeah. Um, you probably have methods to deal with that, right? Yeah, actually, well, the algorithm itself does, right? So like, that's one out of so many hashes that you probably created. 
Okay. So um, the probability that another hash function will like put something right in the same place is really low, probably, depending on the dimension of your space. And so usually that comes really into play. Like even though something happened once, like it's very unlikely that's going to exactly happen again, unless like it was ensured that it was going to happen again. Meaning they're probably they really are like each other. And so yeah, does that help? So, so if again. one hyperplane separates them, that that still leads to the same hash? No, right? Uh, so you can be really, so there's a few different ways that you can think about this. There's a couple, so like the, the algorithm that I give you is very simple, uh, this random hyperplane. There's other methods to kind of deal with when some, like at least like so many of the hashes agree, then it's essentially similar, right? So there's ways of kind of tweaking it so that you're not so con like conservative. So yeah, that's fair. Any other question? Um, yeah. So the data stream API that you use for implementing this was not originally built for approximative computing. Right. right. Um, do you feel that there are uh, specific, for example, functions or specific semantics that uh, would be useful to have? That is a really good question. Um, well, like, actually, one of the things that I kept, keep, kept thinking to myself while working on this uh, was, why not just like, kind of contribute this to Flink, right? Like, as, like, um, and one is like actually like some of the questions you guys are asking, which is like, I feel like some people might get like really put off by the idea of like I have to fi define the, the the number of hyperplanes like so much so that they might not just believe that like this is actually a fairly stable thing. It's uh, like an algorithm that will consistently perform at what the level you need it. Um, so like, what kind of functionality? At, that's a really good question. I guess, like in a way, I just never thought about that while been working on this and um, and with my teammates. So, uh, yeah, I guess like immediately, nothing. In in a way, the APIs are actually really beautiful in that like they're really simple to kind of modify for things like this. So yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, I guess I have a question. Yeah. Uh, for the p formula, like uh, the one minus p square for oh, formula, right, yeah. did you guys research this by your own, or you use it from somewhere else? Oh yeah, no, no, no. So that's why this is here. <laughs> like, and in many ways, like I'm indebted to everyone who's been doing this stuff. Actually, so differently, like there's a lot of there's a lot of people in this field. Actually, there's lots of really smart people that I'm relying on that have written about this stuff in the last few years. So. Uh, for example, there's a lot of people at Stanford that have done stuff like this. Like, for example, if you just v read uh, the Mining Massive Datasets textbook, uh, you'll find a fair amount of this LSH stuff. But you won't find like the like potential like problems you'll run into if you do it in distributed streams, right? So like, there's a lot of things that you'll just have to play with on your own that you'll run into and kind of come up with your own solutions. Um, and, and another one that actually is really interesting to me uh, in having worked on this kind of independently, but then kind of preparing a talk to make sure that like I'm giving credit where credit is due, is actually like this paper uh, where there's actually a, a primitive operator for similarity joins in data cleaning. Uh, it's a fascinating paper that's like they basically saying the same thing, but they were working with their own kind of data structures and stuff like that. And okay, so, yeah. and I have one more question. It, uh, for the past positive, or mm -hmm. did you guys consider machine learning algorithm to do? Because like usually mm -hmm. the false positive is a hard problem because like a user is uh, doing something, right, right, and then in the middle is interrupted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, machine learning on the false positives. To avoid I think we're, those we're definitely, I think, always trying to think of creative solutions to mitigating false positive rates. Um, so like but in particular with this, it's a, like, yeah, I guess I, uh, n not, not per se. Yeah, I guess, okay. yeah. So but yeah, it's a yeah, good Maybe question. you can yeah. consider in the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah. let's thank you. Yeah.